And here we are once again. We have returned. I have a beverage, and life is good. So, what was it we were talking about there? Oh, let me throw the uh, the thing back up here. Boop, 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 boop. Boom. Okay, cabinets. Who doesn't love them? So we were talking before about setting up the. Uh, hold on one second. I got to set up this beverage here. There we go. Boom. We were talking before about uh, setting up, uh, you know, getting things level in general. So, so that that's one question I have for you. Then, how in the world do you hang cabinets and you don't even know what level is? Oh, it's a tough one. I mean, you you just got to find a point of reference, you know. Yeah. Get a reference that you can build up some confidence in, and then once you're ready, start building everything off of that, um, and you know, stick to it all the way forward. You know, try to. Make a repeatable point of reference that you can, you know, especially if you're doing cabinets from front to rear, you know, make something you, know, you can repeat every step of the way, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of get a kind of build up some confidence and then, you know, kind of realize what's what's important and what's not important. You know, if, if your roof cabinets slide off a little bit, you know, is it going to matter to you or not? You know, yeah. you know, there's a lot of variation that, you know, is good enough that, you know, only you're going to notice. Right. Um, yeah, you're trying to hang a painting in a room that is not level. attaching to something else that is, is going to screw up. Um, you know, if it's a totally independent cabinet that can just kind of sit up there and sit good enough, then, you know, then go with it. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, as long as it keeps things from hitting the ground, it, it's done its job. So, but how, how are those uh, attached to the, uh, how are those attached to the wall? Uh, so that's what I was talking about earlier. The transit is exceptional. I mean, I've, I've only built out an older Sprinter. So and there was a, you know, I think 2007, the Sprinter changed their whole body design. So I've, I've not tried to build a new one. Maybe they've improved. Mm -hmm. um, but the transit has holes everywhere. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are the same size. So I use like a quarter by 20 plus nut, mm -hmm. um, just like a riv nut, but it, it, uh, splays out a little bit wider on the back to give you a little more confidence that it's going to stay in. Um, so you just go start plugging plus nuts everywhere. Um, and then you've got quarter by 20 holes um, to start screwing stuff into. Um, so then you can do that across your roof supports, across the walls. And then that gives you a really good, uh, you know, kind of a, a frame to start bolting things to. Yeah. I was trying to, oh, I hope I didn't do what I think I just did. Yeah. So, so for like the, the, pieces did you cut them all out by hand or did you use the shop bot or how did you kind of design them um almost all of those are by hand the i'm i've not actually been signed off on the shop bot yet but those face frames the just the kind of rectangle with the rectangle hole in it mm -hmm. um the when i was kind of getting to that phase there happened to be another guy um at the shop that was using the shop bot and i you know talked to him that you know, I know how to CAD stuff out um, and generally understand tool paths and depths and kind of the safety precautions. So I asked him if I went ahead and got him the files, if I made him the files and kind of set up the tool paths, if he would basically go through, double check everything for me and run the part. Um, and he was hanging around doing some work for a few days. So he did that for me. Um, but so, so really the only thing I bothered doing ShopBot was just those face frames. I mean, on that photo that's cycling through, I think there's four. There's mm -hmm. four on that side, and there's going to be two more on the other side. Okay. Um, everything else, the you know the, the the vertical supports that kind of have that like the one inch radius on the front, and then those the supports towards the rear that do the one inch radius, but then go ahead and go on down. Those are all um, done by hand, and I guess it's sort of a hybrid done by hand, done by template. So I do like a cardboard template, then I transfer that to a sheet of you know like uh, what is it, like three sixteenths melamine or something. Mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead and refine it some more. Make sure everything's nice. You know, like because melamine, you can kind of sand, and it's it's pretty forgiving and easy to work with. And then once you have your real template, then you can take that over to your Baltic birch, um, and then start screwing that into your birch, cutting, rough cutting it on the bandsaw, and then taking it to a you know, like a flush uh, flush cutting bit on the router, and just start routing your your pieces. And, you know, as long as your template doesn't move on you or change shapes on you you can pretty much have a good repeatable pattern wow yeah i think i think doing that on the on the shop bot is definitely the uh the way forward for sure rather than hitting it with the router i mean right or yeah, is that just for the final pieces or 
you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you can either eyeball your template and then just start cutting from your template. Or if you want to do it the shot bot route, you've got to, you've got to make your template and then turn oh. it into CAD. Okay. And you know, it's one of those things that I don't have experience doing that. I mean, I, I know some techniques where you use grid paper and measurements and I, and I know roughly how some people do it. I've just never gone through the process of taking a goofy shape in person and turning it into a goofy shape on the computer and, and making it work. Nice. So uh, uh, in the chat, we had a, uh, a couple of comments here. Uh, one person wanted to know if the sin shop was open and uh, that person can just head on over to uh, sinshop.org forward slash, uh, what is it, COVID status or? Yeah, COVID status will tell them if the shop's open, right? Yeah, you can also, if you just go to the home page, there's like the little stoplight. Um, if someone's actually at the shop, that'll go green. That's right. Um, another place to check out is if you go to our Discord channel. So if you're not a, if you're a Discord member in person shop, just go there. Otherwise, if you need to sign up, go to sinshop.org forward slash discord, and that'll give you the redirect link uh, from your web browser to actually get to the right place. And uh, the people that are keeping the shop open, uh, 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 you can just ask in there. And uh, also, we had uh, another person in chat ask why an Amish guy is on a tech podcast. This person is apparently not listening to the show because we're talking about cabinetry. And if there's one thing us Amish people know, it's cabinetry. Are, are you the Amish guy? Or? I don't know. I mean, it's it's a spectrum, you know, like furries. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's some people that just like the fox and the hound. Yeah. Everyone's a little bit Amish. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a spectrum, you know, so whatever. But yeah, so uh, that's, uh, there's some some questions from the peanut gallery there. So uh, also, I, I did want to want to get back to this here. I noticed you used was it the Krieg jig, where it does all the pocket holes? Is that? Am I yeah, I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, I noticed you Craig. did that. Yes, Craig. I don't know. Yeah, one of those. I actually am German. I'm not Amish, but I actually am German. You'd think I'd be able to pronounce that. But uh, so, you, I noticed you used that on on all of that stuff. Any any reason for that specifically, as opposed to you know Brad's or you know. Um, there's kind of a combination around. I mean, a lot of the cabinetry is assembled with pocket holes. I mean, I know a lot of true cabinet pros, you know, scoff at the idea of, of the pocket holes, but yeah, it's not perfect. I mean, it's not high end cabinets by any means. Um, but, you know, I built, I built the cabinets in the second van with them and I've taken it down some pretty nasty roads for okay. many, many years. And seems to hold together so i thought why change maybe mm -hmm. you know, second man was kind of a bit of a nerve-wracking experience wondering you know if all the rumors of the pocket holes was going to come true and they were always going to fall apart the moment i hit a speed bump but um they seem to hold together hold together pretty well i mean there's there's a few areas that are pocket holes reinforced with glue um you know basically just using the, the pocket screws to just kind of act as clamps mm -hmm. uh, you know so just kind of depending on what purpose I needed you know I, I kind of changed things around then there are places that are um, clamped uh, glued clamped and brads um, mm. to kind of go all three so uh, I can't even remember what I did that on I think my, my bed frame I did that where I just needed to get rid of all flex because I had a one one piece of wood you know spanning the entire width of the van so I just need to eliminate all the flex I possibly could so I kind of went overboard there mm. well, that's cool I've never, I've never gotten the art of, of pocket holes down. It's always been the, the dark arts for me, but that's awesome. I get, I'm sure it's exactly once. And that was, uh, to make our Hebocon, uh, uh, contest. Oh, is that right? Uh, arena. Yeah. Huh. I did not do a good job at it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it went poorly. <laughs> I, I probably would have been better off using, you know, you know, traditional tongue groove joinery and stuff like that. But. Cause I'm more familiar with that. But. Yeah. That's awesome. Like that, that's really cool. I, I would, like I was saying before, I'm, I'm definitely a wood glue and Brad's kind of guy myself, but I mean, that's what I used actually to make these back. I would do that every, every show that, that stuff back there is all made on the shop bot. And then for the cross braces and all that, it's, it's, you know, Brad are glued and bratted or however you put that, but yeah, so and it's, it's solid. 
Yeah, I think that, you've got a picture of it. Back there is welded. That's that's my preferred <laughs> way of doing it. <laughs> I need to get into the shop and, and weld more. I really need to do that once you know once all the horrible thing is gone. But uh, and also tons of respect on this thing here for using the actual you know tongue and groove and the the bevels and all that stuff. Um, yeah, is that the that kind of goofy looking box thing? Yeah, the the, the drawer. Yeah. It looks, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. How much how much effort do you want to put into utilizing every bit of space you have? I mean, you know, if I was if I was building this for someone else, I would probably never do that, um, just because it's a big time suck just to get that e extra space. So that's basically a drawer that overlaps the wheel well. You know? So it's the bottom drawer in the cabinets where the wheel well is, but it sits okay. just forward enough that there's that little space behind it that, you know, a reasonable person would have just said, "The hell with that space. We don't need that extra, you know, eight square inches." Oh. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to push the drawer back there, but that wheel well sits on that side. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, well, let's see if I can see what kind of drawer I can build. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, yeah, I was see. I thought that that was underneath the uh, the your sink, and that that was trying to get around the the the, the trap. I thought that's what that was for. But you, now I see what you're talking about. That's that's to go in the in the back of the van and, and get around the wheel well. I love the, like so this whole design for all the drawers and all that stuff. That was all you, huh? Or did you get that from like a like a uh, kitchen oh. standards? You know, 35 inch countertops. Um, you know, six inch drawer heights are kind of kind of your standard. You know, upper drawer height in the kitchen. I think. Um, you know, kind of loosely base it off of that with, you know, modifications where I need to just make it work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, back to your question of why don't I just buy IKEA cabinets? Um, you know, kind of back to the very beginning of the show is, uh, you know, things built for houses are not built to use every bit of space. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, kitchen cabinets have the toe kick, um, you know, a big, you know, four inch toe kick that's just absolutely wasted space across the entire bottom side of your cabinets. Yeah. Um, this space I'm not willing to let go to waste. So, you know, it's a matter of whether you want to sacrifice the toe kick if you're willing to not need it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess if you have small feet or whatever, I don't know what your criteria are. <laughs> um, but if you're willing to sacrifice it, or I've seen people build the toe kick into their bottom drawer, um, which is pretty pretty slick. Oh, that's pretty clever, yeah. That's a neat way of doing it. Yeah, yeah the yeah. other thing is IKEA cabinetry or, or IKEA furniture is it's meant to be assembled in place and then never moved again. And then you might be able to move it once if you're lucky. I've I've had really good luck with the with the collapses. That's 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 this is my empire of, of collapses right here. But uh, I've had good luck with those. Uh, but generally speaking, everything else. Yeah. It is shocking. What type of stuff that it is like some stuff works better than others. Like yes. my bed is built really well. The nightstands for said bed are garbage. <laughs> so. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, yes. On both of those things. It's, it's absolutely astounding how many records you can put onto a five by five. I think it's collax. It's either collax. They used to call it something else, but then they redid it. But uh, it's, it's staggering how much weight you can put on one of those. It's ridiculous. Um, and it'll hold for forever. I got the, the other side of this, of this wall is mostly records. So <laughs> collect a lot of records, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so yeah, no, the, I, I love the look of these. So is there a reason that you went with a, like a, the open handle rather than closing it off and putting a door handle on it? So that is actually not the handle that is, um, that's the front of the drawer box. Um, and so later on, I think you've got a photo somewhere where you actually show in the drawer faces. So the latch that I chose, oh. it's, it's, it's sold to like, you know, the boating world. Um, it's like a little pull latch. You like pull the little trigger out and it, you know, it's a locking latch. Yeah. And so, you know, the normal, the traditional way you build a drawer is you build the box, you get the box mounted up on your, on your rails. And then once your box is mounted, then you line up the face frame. And like the face frame is what you need to like line up and attack it into place, kind of independent of the box. And so that's what I did on this one. I mean, you got a photo cycling there where you see the white face face of the drawer, not the face frame, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the little cutout you saw there was, I guess that was another piece that I did on the shop by. And that's basically the front of the drawer box, but it, it allows that, uh, that locking latch to go through. Okay. Uh, 
so it, it was kind of a fun a fun little thing to do you know on v carve or whatever just to you know throw a rectangle with a center line and a bezier curve on it just to you know it's something that's simple but it looks pretty it looks great yeah absolutely and so I, I I noticed that that drawer hinge that you have there looks a lot like a server rail. <laughs> looks like yeah, it is. It is uh you know the best Amazon drawer drawer slide you can get. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. That is, you know <laughs> that is one good thing I will say about IKEA. Their hardware is really good. Like if you get the good right. stuff, like the the soft close hinges that they have, they are like butter. Like we've, we've got, we've got that stuff in our kitchen and it's, man, I'll tell you, you, there is not a drawer that can be slammed in our home, no matter how hard you try. I didn't try that hard, but, but still. Good anger management technique. You know, I never, since we're in the post game, especially I'll diverge. I never understood that. I never understood the idea of breaking your own stuff. I'm, I'm not relating this to the things that are going on outside. But, but breaking your own, like if you're in your house and you're like, oh, I'm mad at this phone call, I'm going to throw my phone. I never understood that. You know what I mean? Cause the thing, cause the original problem's still there, but now you have that problem and a broken phone. Yeah. My ex who, who got mad and she broke her own screen on her laptop. I was like, well, that's not productive. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't fix the problem, but I guess, I guess if you're, if you're just that mad about something, then, then, okay, there you go. Sorry. Quick diversion there. We're back. Uh, really so, durable stuff that can handle being thrown around and, and, and you're fine. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you can't do that with a phone. A phone's a yeah. phone. IBM I mean. model M keyboard. You can get really mad at that. <laughs> That'd be fine. <laughs> You could rob a liquor store with one of those. Like, give me your money. Um, no, those are those are ridiculous. Um, so, oh, I was going to ask you. So, uh, we mentioned about. The, I don't remember if we talked about the stove or not. The, so, the stove that still runs off. That's electric. That runs off of your regular battery power. No, the stove is propane. Oh, it is propane. Um, the heater, the heater is combination electric for the blower but uh it's plumbed into the gasoline uh the gas you know the gas tank for the van oh um, i actually don't even have the heater installed yet because it's you know currently 110 degrees outside so it's one of my last things i'm going to worry about yeah yeah you got you got time to let that one slide for sure <laughs> it is hot oh my god uh so yeah more look at the uh, at the wiring so that's going back to what we were saying before that's the original wiring harness right yeah, the, I don't see what photo you're looking at right now, but that big black kind of wrapped cable that just kind of goes down the entire side. That's the yeah. original one that once I kind of get the cabinets on that side in place, that's kind of, that is one of the next things I'm going to be working on. Once I get the cabinets kind of in place there, then you got to go back and start cutting grooves and kind of mm -hmm. getting a place for that higher harness to sit. Yeah, so cool. So uh, right now I got a picture up of the water tank that I'm thinking it's water. It's either water or, protein, or propane that's underneath the uh, truck, the white cylind cylindrical tank. The one underneath is propane. It's a horizontal, I can't remember, it's not West, I don't remember the, the brand name, but it's a horizontal tank sold to the RV market. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, it was, it was one of those relatively easy things to install. You know, you find holes on the subframe. Um, kind of, you just, you know, when I, when I built my current van, mm -hmm. um, uh, it was a, so the transit came out in 2015 and my, my current van is a 2015. So a lot of people hadn't really figured a lot of these things out yet. Mm. Uh, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to risk buying one of these propane tanks. Cause it's like a $400 tank. I didn't want to like risk buying one and like not being able to figure out how to get it up there. Yeah. Um, so I didn't bother on the current van, um, but then, you know, nowadays, you know, it's 2020, people have been doing this for a while, and there's lots of posts on the forums and Instagrams and blogs and whatever. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's about, you know, half a dozen different techniques, like different ways people have documented on how they've attached a propane tank underneath. And so one take, technique, he said, oh, I just bought this tank, and it basically just bolts into place with, you know, a very small modification. Yeah. Um, and so I basically followed that and it, it clicks right in there that's cool and then i guess you have your your filler hookups there underneath that metal shield yeah um yeah just a 
simple. I mean, it's pretty much like every RV, Westphalia, you know, every kind of camper van setup. It's that just, you know, bomb that hangs off the bottom side of your car. That <laughs> yeah. Pretty easy to get to. I had thought about doing uh, onboard air for my, for my uh, Cherokee. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm going to pump that thing, pump a metal propane tank up to 200 PSI, huh? Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's a little unnerving, you know. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Hope you don't get T-boned or something right in that spot. Well, well, so what I was actually thinking of doing is making a tube, uh, tubular bumper and welding up the ends. Don't do that. You know what bumpers are designed for? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but... Yeah, all right. <laughs> I shouldn't do that. I really want to, but I shouldn't do that. I mean, though, the 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 point being that it wouldn't. It's not an additional tank that's going to weigh down the car. Not like, oh, I can't wait to explode someone that rear ends me. That's not. It's not where I'm going with that. But that is kind of what would happen. I would definitely. I would have to put like a safety valve on there of some sort, you know, so that that doesn't. Yeah, but then I guess if you pop the balloon, you pop the balloon. So yeah. Yeah, it seems a. Uh... Bad idea. But people do it a lot. Like, it is not yeah. uncommon. So, I don't know. Maybe there's a way, like, I could make it like the, uh, you know, like sliders underneath, you know, where people do one by sixes and connect those across at some point. Then at least it's on the bottom of the car. It's not like just saying, hey, hit me. Win a prize. <laughs> you know, at least then if it pops, it's it's not going to hurt anybody else because I'll... What's or up? get an air compressor that can just be run off battery that provides the power, the air, the pressure you need. No, what I actually do is I take, I have a uh, 20 gallon, I think. It's not that, it's not that big. It's something like, like that, like that, plus than 20. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, but it's a smaller one. So I'll fill that at home and just put it in the trunk or, you know, back hatch area. But anyway, so uh, electric. So you did all this whole design. We talked about this a little bit earlier when we were talking about the uh, solar stuff. That's all. That's all yours as well, right? That's all your design. Yeah, I mean the actual wiring layout. It's 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 another one of those battles of, you know, how how I guess Instagram worthy do you want it to be or whatever. You know, how pretty do you want it to be, and you know, how much time do you want to spend doing it? And sure. How many holes do you want to punch in the wall getting to that point? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I what I have here, I'm I'm pretty happy with. You know, once I got halfway through it, I realized like, oh, if I you know turn the whole thing 90 degrees and ran all the wires down the middle, it would have made some of the channeling and organization a little bit nicer. But you know, whatever, it, it still gets yeah. the job done. You still got AC DC separation. Mm -hmm. um, you still got clear fuses. You still got you know things wrapped up nice and neat. So it doesn't you know it doesn't look the prettiest necessarily, but it's certainly prettier than I've done in the past, and I'm I'm happy enough with it. No, yeah, it certainly doesn't look bad. I don't know. What are? Um, go ahead. But yeah, as far as the components, you know, the I don't know if I'm seeing the photo of the the yeah. that's in the the back of the van right now. Yep. I've got it stuck up right there. Mm -hmm. So the you know I've got the the top left thing is a solar charge controller. It's it's a dual purpose solar charge controller and a. Uh, it'll siphon extra power off your alternator and charge. So it'll, you know, mm. if you're driving down the road, it'll help charge your batteries. Um, so it's a dual purpose machine. Um, and then the big gray box down below is an inverter charger. So it's a 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter, um, you know, for turning DC into AC for running tea kettles and blenders and computers and that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, but it also handles um, converting AC back into DC so for like short power. Um, so if you just want to pull up somewhere and, plug in i guess it does a third thing it does pass through um it does an auto switching pass through so if you're you know currently got your your computer running inside off of batteries and you plug in the outside it'll you know auto switch uh, and run you off short power um hmm. without interruption oh okay so kind of sort of kind of like an ats like automatic twi uh, uh transfer switch transfer switch yeah yeah, yeah man, it, it's exactly what it is you just got one built in that's cool. Okay. Um, and then everything else is bus bars and, you know, 200, 300 amp fuses, uh, switches, you know, fuse panel that's for just red thing in the center. Uh, that that's just like a, that's just a switch. Um, okay. that's, that is the switch for the solar. Um, so I didn't need a, I didn't need fuses there cause it's, or I didn't need a breaker there because it's fused up on the roof, uh, close to the solar panels. 
um, and I had one of those switches. So that is just a just a turn knob switch for the for the solar, so I can shut the solar off before it hits the charge controller if I ever need to do any work on the charge controller. That's not the emergency red button. That's not the <laughs> everything's on fire. Uh, Push the red button. No, depends how big of a fire there is. Well, fair enough. Yeah. Huh. That's really cool. Um, and you know, that's a lot of, you know, I think the electrical part is scary for a lot of people. Just, I mean, it is, it, it is, and it should be scary because yeah. that's how, that's, what's going to burn down your van when you're, when you're out on a hike or something and you're going to, something is going to go wrong. You didn't fuse anything out. And all of a sudden you've got a, you know, 200 amp arc welder in the back of your van going crazy. Um, and so, you know, just kind of just fuse everything. If in, if in doubt, just fuse it, yeah. you know, put, a, put extra fuse, put extra breakers, like, more won't hurt anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did that as well with my uh, uh, light bar on my truck. I had, you know, relays and fuses. I think I've got, I've got probably one too many fuses, but I was like, you know what? Just like, just what you said, if I'm out on the middle of a trail and all of a sudden the car starts smoking, that's, that's a bad, that's bad. We don't want that. No, thank you. Yeah. So uh, that was all of the, the technical stuff, but I did want to kind of circle back around, I guess, uh, go back to the beginning and, and say, you know, like, was it a matter of I'm tired of being in the same place for too long? Or was it like, uh, I want to see the world and I can't because I'm working too damn much or like some combination of that? Like what, what, what was it about that van life that you were just like, you know, let's, let's get out of here. Let's, let's do the thing it all kind of I mean it all kind of came in a bunch of phases I mean I I had the typical nine to five like programmer job back in you know 2012 when I quit that job and it was one of those things you know I'm fortunate enough to be in the tech field and yeah. able to to save away some invest some and just have enough to not have to worry about the day-to-day -day. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things you know there was a lot of things I felt like I was missing out on by just sitting at a desk every day so I quit that job and kind of you know, disappeared to Central America for eight months and just kind of did some, followed some passions and followed some interests and just kind of just goofed around for a while and wow. came back, did some contract work, um, you know, rented a house, you know, rented an apartment, whatever. Yeah. Kind of went back to normal life, went back to work and, you know, I had my, you know, traveled. I, I still travel constantly. I mean, mostly in the Southwest, you know, I, and then kind of when I made the the jump into trying out the, the very first van, um, you know, I started dating a girl that was a teacher so we could escape every summer and hit the road mm -hmm. so we definitely mm -hmm. spent a lot of time on the road but still home base in vegas and then um you know like i said a year and a half ago it kind of came the transition of uh you know i needed a you know relationship ended and it was time to do something different and mm -hmm. i already owned a van and i was like you know what the heck i've got a remote job i've got a van like let's just go for it you know it's yeah. Go leave leave town. It was coming up on summer last year. It was time to just leave town and you know, went up and learned how to fly fish and spent a bunch of river time with the dog and just you know, it's not necessarily cost savings. I mean, I'm a frug I'm usually pretty frugal, so it's there's always cost in the back of my mind of like, oh I'm saving rent, I'm saving mortgage, whatever. But you know, it's not necessarily because of that. Uh -huh. Um it's just kinda just fun and you know, I think I, I remember back to, you know, when I got my first, you know, adult job back when I was like 21 or whatever, and, and you know, felt like, you know, whatever paycheck I had at the time, I felt like I was rich and, you know, you know finally could buy stuff that wasn't the cheapest crap at Walmart. Right. Um, you know, kind of just getting to a point where I realized that wasn't the, that wasn't what was important to me. I mean, what was important was going places and seeing people and reconnecting with old friends from around the country I knew and just like getting back out there and, minimizing the crap that I own and the crap that I had to put in storage every time I wanted to change, change, change paths. So yeah, I kind of re reverse course. And I mean, it took me, took me more years to sell the crap off and get rid of most of it than it did to buy it all and kind of minimize life back down. And I've still got a storage unit full of too much junk. Isn't um, it weird? Like me, me and my wife have been together for, I think 17 years, 18 years, something like that. And it is astounding how much crap two people can get. How much, it's not like we're, it's not like we're loaded by any stretch of the imagination. You know, it's just like we get a thing here and then a thing there. And next thing you know, we've got 15 flashlights. It's like, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's weird how much, how much junk 
you're able to to accumulate over a set amount of time. It's 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 weird. It and it's like and, and, it will expand to the space available. Well, it, it will absolutely yeah. do that. Yes, we have we have another room that is just filled with stuff that we haven't even unpacked yet, and it's just junk. And we need to like you know that's a that's a thing where we really should like burn through that in a couple weekends or something like that. But a lot of it's like furniture and stuff like that that we can't really get rid of, you know. So it's like, yeah, we, I mean, it's it's certainly a constant battle of you know, how much stuff do I want to have now? And yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's, I would love to have my own like workshop, you know, just have, you know, have a live somewhere where I could have just like a shed out back with like my own woodworking tools. I, you know, I'm certainly someone who likes building stuff. I'd love to just have like a tinker space. That's just my very own, mm -hmm. um, you know, cooking is one of my biggest passions. And I, I do, you know, that's part of what's in my storage unit is like all my cooking setup. You know, I love bread baking and pasta work and, you know, just everything elaborate. Mm -hmm. um you know, that's one of those things like when i'm currently living in the van i mean that's why i put so much focus on the kitchen and the stove and everything in the van because like well i want to bring a little bit of that with me and you know just because i'm camped out by some river in idaho or something doesn't mean i don't want to make pasta that day yeah um so i'm trying to trying to bring a little bit of comforts of you know what i find important with me and you know i'm not forever going to live in a van i mean um but yeah, it's one of those things. Do it, do it while it's available and while it's easy, and um, who knows what life will bring. If you know, if I'm fortunate enough to live a long, happy life, you just never know. Uh, you dropped off for me at uh, if I'm fortunate enough to live a long, happy life. Oh, sorry. Just you know, you know, not everyone lives. You know, until they're 80 years old. You know, try to do do what you want to do while you can, and yeah, you know, someday I'll probably live in a house and have lots of lots of junk and you know i'll go through that but yeah. you know right now i just get rid of it all and just go wander around and you know go to canada go to mexico go to wherever just kind of goof around and you know especially you know if you're fortunate enough to be able to have a remote job and hopefully after this pandemic a lot more people are going to be that fortunate to have have a remote job that they can you know kind of balance that mm -hmm. uh work from the road i mean i think that's i think that's going to be something that's uh it's going to be a really cool thing to watch how it plays out in the long term. What what the pandemic impact is on yeah. the work environment. Well, see, I find that extremely interesting because we right now are in a situation where we are finding out. We talked slightly, kind of, about this before the show, but we're in a situation right now where we're finding out a lot of the things that we've been told are just not the case. And what I mean by that specifically, so no one goes off on some somewhere <laughs> crazy. What I mean by that is, you know, oh, well, no, we really do need you to come into the office to do your job. Why? I make Tableau reports. No, no, yeah, but you really need to come in just to, to be here. You know, and now we're realizing that you can keep doing your job just fine, thank you very much, without being in the office. You don't have to be there. You don't have to be there for a meeting. You can, you can remote in. It's okay. You know, and I, and like you were saying, you're interested in seeing what happens after this all clears up. So am I, because a business right now that has everybody working at home, why, why in the world am I paying this much for rent? Why am I paying for all this office furniture? What the hell? And, you know, the employees are happier at home anyway, and I don't have to pay for a space. Yeah. I mean, go look at the books of a lot of companies and one of their biggest items is rent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we at, at my former company, one of the the it was a, a very large media company that you you definitely know. Uh, it, uh, it at my at my former place of employment, they had a guy whose job was just strictly to go around and look at properties that we had already looked at. But <laughs> they were like, no, he's he's got to come out and look at it and sign the thing. And, you know, all the money that they spent on office furniture. And oh, my God. So our function there was taking care of, of that company's facilities here in Vegas, right? And so we install network switches all the damn always. So guess what? Whenever we it was time to put our internet in our office, they paid a, a company $80,000 to come out and install two NEMA boxes. <laughs> I was like, I was like, okay, I see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you could take, 
take half of what you pay on on a, a office building rent and infrastructure and sink that back into yeah. paying for everyone's home internet buy them the top tier internet mm. that you can get pay them you know sink that into perks sink that in sink that into employee happiness and equipment and i mean I think you would end up with a lot happier workforce. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I really do hope that this whole situation does end up in a good place. I I'm I don't know if it's going to be in a good place in the short term, but I, I think at least, you know, I hope at least long term we realize some of the things, some of the ways that we do things don't have to be done the way that we're doing them. So question in chat uh i left for a bit did you cover how you illegally retain a driver's license and registration for plates as most places you must have a permanent address if you change if it changes and you have two weeks to either turn your license or change your address that's a good and that point. is pretty much the bane of every full timer's existence i mean i mean everything from you know young people doing you know hashtag van life crap to you know people who who retire and sell their, you know, half million dollar house and buy a half million dollar RV. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's always a battle what you have to work with. And there is, as far as I know, there is no great way to do it. I mean, you've either got to just kind of fudge it a little bit. I mean, just because, you know, you're legally obligated to have a place of residence, basically. I mean, you know, it's just kind of one of those unfortunate things. I mean, they, they've, they've got a place, they've got to have a place to send a jury to us too. Mm. Um, so it's one of those things like there is no way around it. You've got to have something, um, you know, my kind of mailbox is one of those like online only, you know, where they scan all your mail and you can have the option of them like FedExing it to you or something. Um, and yeah, it takes care of the, the majority of it, but that's, you know, a lot of places still don't accept that. Like the IRS does not accept that as a valid address. So it's just one of those things where, you know, find a, find a friend and, you know, if, Give them, give them 20 bucks or something to use their address just to have a place for, you know, the official crap to go to. I wonder if there's a limit on how small a living space can be. Because if you... uh, that's that's where you're getting into the tiny house community and why. You know, why so many of these tiny houses are built on trailers is basically to just to just skirt around uh, like building codes because um, you can't build a residence below a certain square footage. I mean, there, there's a lot of oddball laws like, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's square footage laws. It's, you know, like for instance, like you, I think it's a friend of mine built a house like out in blue diamond town. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to go like super eco and like do composting toilet, do everything like kind of self-contained. And it was all against building code. Mm -hmm. He had to just, plumbing he had to just kind of do it the old-fashioned way just to just to meet code yeah um, and so there's a lot of archaic codes out there that um you know kind of get in the way of some innovation and, and some lifestyle and kind of societal changes i had toyed around briefly with uh with earth ships with the idea of, of building an earth ship are you familiar with those oh yeah 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 i i i I got I'm not a familiar with the term. So what what so, is earth ship? So an earth ship is an earth bermed building and the way that they make the main walls for it is they take car tires and they ram them full of dirt. And uh you do that to basically make several U stri U-shaped structures uh for each room, right? And you you face the whole building south and you have an angled window on the front. So in the summertime the sun's directly above, it only heats up this much. Whereas in the winter time, it the sun sinks to the horizon and it heats more of the inside, and you cover the whole shebang with dirt. And what you get from that is basically what's called what they call the thermal flywheel effect, where it heats up the tires, it heats up the dirt and all that stuff in the tires, and that basically carries you through the night. So no matter where you are, I think it doesn't get below like high high fifties, low sixties, something like that year round, no matter where you are. And, uh, oh yeah, uh, somebody in the chat says they also use glass bottles for, for some neat walls as well. Yeah, yeah, that was another uh, feature of it. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I've seen stuff like that. Okay, so I, now I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's really big in Taos, New Mexico, but they had really, really clever stuff in those. Like uh, the, the water from the sink would go into a planter full of plants. So you you eat some food and you wash it off and that water goes into the, the planter for the plants. 
uh, says sometimes, oh, someone in the chat says sometimes they use straw bales for walls as well. I, I guess I would worry all about bugs on that, but I guess if you seal it up, then you're, you're no worse off than if you have tires. I, I, yeah, I mean, you're, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different kind of like, you know, you know eco methods of building. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you say Taos, my brother used to live in Taos and I spent a bunch of time around there. I mean, there's like straw bale homes, there's rammed earth homes, there's, you know, car tire mm -hmm. is one of the kind of the notable ones of the earth ships. Um, you know, it's just kind of all about, you know, building up a, building up a thermal mass in your walls that is, you know, kind of a passive, yeah. passive insulation, but then, you know, facing it the right direction. I mean, there's even techniques of, you know, doing like passive cooling in the summer, where if you're lucky enough to like build on a slope, you can sink you know, basically tubing down into the earth and like come out the bottom side, whereas it's, you know, it's obviously not geothermal or anything, but it's using passive air flows to come in. The air comes in from the bottom, sucks mm -hmm. up through the tubes, cools it off, and then is like natural air conditioning. And yeah. I mean, there's, there's it, that's a world that I've been very interested in in my life. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe when you're finally ready to, uh, to put roots down, that'll be the next step. Yeah. You take all the, all the money that you saved on those and, and, and get an earth ship. <laughs> that was one of the yeah, things that stopped me. Yeah, if you're, yeah go ahead. If, go you're ahead. Ever, if you're ever in the Taos area, I mean, there's, there's a bunch there that are open for tour. I mean, you can rent them out as, you know, you rent them to stay in. I mean, it's kind of a really cool yeah. setup there. I should do that. That would be cool. I want to, I want to check one of those out. Definitely. Because like part of the reason why they call it earth ship, it is a little bit, a little bit, more granola than I would usually go for. But part of the reason why they call it an earthship is because they, they explain this in the book. When you're at sea, you have a whole bunch of stuff that you need to constantly monitor. Do I have the right amount of, I don't know, ballast or am I balanced or do I have fuel or do I have battery or do I have this and blah, 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 blah. It's the same way in an earthship in that you have to kind of monitor what you're doing and what your, you know, uh, what's the situation with the gray water tank? What's the situation with this? You have to monitor that stuff. But the payoff for it is, you know, that one, you're basically living off the earth. And two, you know, all of this stuff is completely natural. You're not pumping all the chemicals that you possibly can into the atmosphere. And, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just really clever. Like, I, I love the cleverness of it. Like, he explains uh, about refrigerators, how the design for their refrigerators is basically a box that kind of sort of connects to the outside that you can open whenever it's cold out and then close when it's not, which sounds awesome until the first time you forget to close it. But you know. <laughs> in the, in the, uh, the desert where it's, you know, 106. Oh, during the summer. Yeah, no, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, no, that, that is a, that would be a, a yeah. situation. But even for like, you know, kind of fridge style cooling, I mean, I, I remember looking this up back when I was doing a bunch of bread baking, trying to figure out how to passively keep something cool, how to keep dough cool here in the summer. You know, I mean, yeah. assuming you don't run the air conditioner all the time. I, I, I usually live at a room temperature of 80 degrees in the summer. And, you know, if you want to ferment like sourdoughs, it needs to be like 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, and learning about like the zero pots from India, where it's like a double layer uh, terracotta pot. Mm -hmm. Um, I forget exactly how they're constructed, but it, it's like a kind of like a double layer terracotta pot thing with water in it. And it's basically kind of like a pot version of a swamp cooler where the water evaporates out through the terracotta or, you know, sublimates out through, not sublimates, uh, whatever, goes out through the terracotta, yeah. evaporates, keeps it cool. And the internal, the insides of the pot stays relatively chilly. Interesting. Okay. I think that's Z-E-E-R, zero pot. Zero pot. I got to look that up. That, that, that is interesting. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by all these. Oh, what I loved about it, he explained his, his thinking on it. Like if you're in a more, uh, colder climate, what we're doing with our refrigerators, like the one that's, you know, 30 feet away from me right now is I'm paying money to cool this box, you know, to cool the box that's, that's, that has my food in it. Right. If I'm in a colder climate, then I'm paying to heat the box outside of that box to keep me at the right temperature. And then outside of that box is the cold that I needed in the refrigerator in the first place. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like we're paying twice. We're paying to heat the house and to cool the refrigerator rather than just have it cool the refrigerator in the first place. But then, you know, on the flip side, it's not getting it too cold, you know, still having control yeah. of your cold. Cause if it's, 
you know, zero degrees outside, you don't want your, well, you don't want everything zero degrees, but you still got to have some sort of thermal regulation. Cause I've, I've actually thought about that idea a bunch, you know, sitting there, you know, living in the van somewhere where you've got the heater on, but your fridge is kicking on, you know, three amps drawing battery down just to keep it cold again. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's colder than I want outside. How, like, how could I somehow harness that? That'd be some kind of Arduino related thing with a temperature <laughs> sensor inside the thing and outside of, you know, outside air. There's a, there's a way. Oh, well, there's, there's certainly a way. I mean, it's kind of the, the programmer ethos. So there's always a way depending yeah. on how much time you want to put into it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Cost versus benefit analysis, et cetera. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You could spend a lot of money to come up with like an over engineered solution, but does it cost more to do that than just to do it the traditional way or does it not? Depends on, on your situation. Yeah. I mean, you know, going through these, you know, kind of getting back on topic, actually, oh. like going through these builds, I've, I've run into a number of things where it's been kind of product ideas to me, you know, thinking of like, oh, if I, if I ever fully burn out on my career and want to like do some sort of shift, you know, getting into like some product design, if there's any way to make money on it, you know, like this one being an example of, you know, a fridge that in the winter clearly doesn't need to run a compressor ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can just somehow, you know, you know thermally manage the, the outside air. Um, you know, another one that actually has been solved, it's still fairly expensive is, um, it's used more in the like marine world, um, but it's a fridge that, will detect excess solar power so you know like when you're when you're charging from the solar it's running at a higher voltage than just your your sitting battery voltage mm -hmm. um, so it'll it'll detect like when you're charging it'll cool down a thermal mass inside the fridge you know so it's just i don't know what it's actually made of but it's just like some like heavy thermal mass so like when you've got excess power it just like pumps the mass full of cold and then basically all night when you don't have any more solar it just shuts off hmm. And so it's just kind of a way to just build up cold and just let it float all night when you don't have power or you don't have excess power. So that's the system that you have currently, or that's one you're, you're thinking about designing? Um, that exists already. Mm -hmm. My, the fridge that I got on this fan is a little bit fancier and it has not quite that level. It will go ahead and cool. It'll cool extra mm -hmm. like down, like not to freezing, but it'll get right above freezing during the day if it detects voltage over you know, whatever threshold, uh, you know, like your bulk charging threshold. Um, and then it goes back into standard mode during the day. But there are ones that are even more advanced where they have some sort of thermal body inside that it's like a whole secondary cooling system that'll go ahead and like cool that down and then recirculate that during, during the night. Hmm. You know, a lot of this is, a lot of this stuff, I mean, even my fridge is designed for the marine world where plugging in is not an option. I mean, if you're, if you're doing like a transatlantic crossing, like, um, you know, you are, you have what you have. Um, and so it, yeah. it's a way to conserve power, you know, especially if you're on a smaller boat, you can't just throw up more solar panels. You can't run a generator cause you're going to run out of fuel after two weeks of a six week crossing. And, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting ways to solve problems, even on the like, gadget side. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm still thinking about that fridge. I got to admit it, it would not take that much to do it. I'm talking like, You'd have to have a servo on the intake in intake air, a servo on the uh, exhale air, basically. Two temperature sensors, one of them outside and one of them in the fridge, and an Arduino, and you're good. Yeah, I mean, not I mean, honestly, not really even an Arduino, but just kind of a you know, basic circuitry with a PID controller. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was going the the easy to program route. Oh, uh, Servo20 in the chat says Crux is very lo is looking very low res. He he is. He is. Bandwidth. Yeah. Right. He's he's so. he's filming on a potato tonight. So, you know. Cox. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Cox, yes. Cox is a, is definitely a thing. Yeah. It's in this neighborhood and probably actually on Cox's network in general, it, it tends to be oversaturated. So. The, yeah, that is a true statement. We really should look at, yeah, Pixel Crux. Yep, that's him. That's him. So, well, I'll tell you what, Sean, it, it, it has been absolutely wonderful talking with you tonight. Uh, it, that's This has been really cool. Like, I, I, I love being able to showcase 
projects that our members are doing. And this is such a epic project. I mean, you're building your own, your own home essentially, you know, <laughs> it's, and this is the third time that you've done it. That's like super cool, man. Like you've got all this, all this, you know, cabinetry and you've got you know, the, uh, 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 electrical side of things. You've got, you know, uh, Oh, that was one thing I meant to ask forever ago. Sorry. Okay. This will be my final thought. Sleeping. I don't see any, <laughs> there's no bed in there or is there, is that coming later or what? Uh, that is still to come. So that back platform area, this is another idea I've not seen anybody else do. Hmm. Um, and I actually did it on the second van where a lot of people, it's kind of, you know, it's, you know, one of the photos you showed earlier had bikes set up in the back. And mm -hmm. so I like taking, you know, a couple bikes with me, road bike, mountain bike on travels. And so that's obviously something that only gets so small. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, that's kind of like one of the things you have to build off of. Um, and so then a lot of people, a lot of people like, you know, you balance bike storage with bed platform size and just how you all, how you want it all to play together. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people, a lot of vans I see, you know, on Instagram blogs, whatever, um, they do the full length bed permanent. And so, you know, a full length bed is, you know, at least what, 74 inches long yeah. for like a, normally i think the standard um, length is 80 man, so. a lot of bed space that you're sucking up um you know luckily the transit is 78 inches wide so you have room to put a little bit of insulation and still have a 74 inch bed i think hmm. um, and so that's what i did on my second one um I'm but then i have this like fold down platform thing um i'm still fast so forwarding. That, was, that was one of the things i was trying to solve on the second van which i've copied on the third one was you know, looking at like, I only use the bed for, you know, obviously a few hours a day. Right. And then I don't want that space wasted the rest of the day that I want to use the van. So how can I take half of that bed and shove it up into the wasted space, you know, the, the above the bed part. Mm -hmm. um, and so I came up with this folding platform idea. Um, yeah. So you can see, you just pass some photos where you kind of saw the, well, you probably passed it a minute ago. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let's see where, where I can see the what. Oh, you can kind of looking back towards. Um, I know, and you can see that platform there. You look back towards the kitchen. I had the um, one that had the uh, that had the bikes in it. That's that was the one I was looking for. This is the old oh, okay. older one. Uh, once I finally stopped, sorry, because that was like a minute ago that I did all this. My apologies. <laughs> uh, uh, well, anyway, when it finally stopped, your picture is so fast it's nearly a film. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so that was an idea I came up with on the second one was to basically fold half of the bed up. And on the second van, I actually used, um, like ATV loading ramps from Harbor Freight. They're, oh, they're yeah. dirt cheap. Yeah. 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 And two of them, they come in, they come in like a trifold setup. Mm -hmm. And so I chopped one of them off and two of them was just the perfect size. And I had to cut the hinges off and reverse them. Um, but then they fold up, they, you know, kind of folds twice in the same direction so it kind of folds up into a c and so basically the mattress and everything you know you have to make the bed the mattress and then you just like wrap it up on itself and then just hook it back there with some uh clips yeah you got a photo up that you can see the it's down it's halfway down right there okay we're on we're uh, on the same page the the feed that i'm looking at is even late even earlier than that and so i'm like man how many times did i cycle through those damn things jesus but uh <laughs> so this is uh, this is van two though right that is van two. So the current van, you can over on the driver's side behind the kitchen. I decided to go ahead and build a bit of a cabinet there just for some extra storage. Mm -hmm. um, again, it was van two was not designed to be full time. It was designed for weekend and month and summertime travels. Mm -hmm. um, van three was for I want to take some more crap with me and potentially for all seasons. So if you know if I go north in the summer, I don't have to come back before summer's over. Okay. And so I decided I wanted some of that storage along that wall. So I downsized the bed a little bit um, and then turned it the other way. So then I'm still going to do the hinged uh, platform thing. I'm going to fabricate it myself instead of using loading ramps. Mm -hmm. uh, but it'll still be there. I haven't gotten to that phase yet. Uh, so it's not in any of the photos, but it's going to be the same concept, that same kind of two or you know double or trifold setup mm -hmm. um, in that way. You know, a lot of people do a lot of people do, a, you know, like bench seats and a table in the back, but then you've got to remake the bed and you've got to take the bed down every single time. And I just I don't want to have to reassemble the bed you know, yeah. every single day. 
And so I like this concept because like as long as you make the bed and you know just tidy up and make it every day, all you have to do is just roll it back up, you know, roll it up like a hot dog and clip it into place. And okay. then you're gonna bring it down, you unclip it, you fold it out, and it's done. So essentially then the bed is going to be going over the sink. Right? Yeah, so so it unfolds out over the kitchen. Right. Oh, that is clever. Okay. And so then, you know, the kitchen cabinets are the reinforcement or the, you know, the, the, the base to it, I guess. The base of it, yeah. I mean, until you have to get a drink in the middle of the night, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> well, it doesn't totally cover the no, I'm, Yeah, yeah. No, I'm playing. If you're not thinking that far ahead, then you got other issues. <laughs> yeah. the bed, you just kind of reach over and operate the, the sink. Well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Just like put your head underneath the faucet. And... <laughs> well, that's that is really cool, man. So, well, it, uh, I guess it's about that time to wrap this up. Uh, uh, you, anybody got any final thoughts? So, one question I had. So, since this is like your third van, is like as you iterate, you know, are there any like things that you did wrong on uh, earlier versions that 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 you have since corrected on newer versions? I would say, well, at least none that are coming to mind now. Like, nothing that I've done, like, glaringly wrong, like, I hugely regretted. Um, but it's definitely a learning process of just space utilization and, and honestly, just, like, part selection. I mean, just, you know, parts, you know, 12-volt parts, you know, finding, finding low-profile puck lights that are 12-volt is hard. I mean... You know, because all the listings on Amazon, they don't list the they don't list the actual voltage of the LEDs. They just it's you know it adapts through a wall wart and it plugs into the wall. And so to actually figure out, well, if I cut the wire, is the actual LED itself 12 volt or not? So it's like it's just going through a lot of hassle of ordering something, looking at you know it's stamped on there somewhere, but it's just not on the Amazon listing. And like going through and just like figuring out what parts to use. I mean, that is by far the most time consuming thing. And just one of those things where you get to a point and say, well, I guess I'll order it and go with this. Um, you know, learning the different fridges, you know, learning the different like compressor technologies. And, um, you know, so I wouldn't say any major regrets, just kind of, you know, I build a van for the use that I have at the time. Um, and, you know, it's always evolving and I, Kind of my general idea is I want to build it, use it long enough, but not too long, so it's not worthless to sell. Um, you know, if I can if I can bear minimum break even on it, then super happy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the first the first van I built, I made a little bit of profit on it. Um, second van, I, I'm about to list it, hopefully within the next couple of weeks to get it sold. Um, and then third van, you know. I don't know. I, I keep seeing what vans are going for because like the van life thing is so trendy now and everyone wants a van and the prices are insane that you know I keep looking at what vans that look, you know, like mine or something are going for. I'm like, oh man, maybe I should just sell the third one and start a new one. Like um But it's, I don't know. Yeah, just it's kind of more of an evolution than, you know, a, a, a situation of regret or anything. So is that a thing in, in the van community where like you know, the, the people that have been doing it for years, like you see all the, all the kids that come in and, and are like, ah, damn kids <laughs> buying up all the vans and I can't get a 12 volt light anywhere. And you know, like, <laughs> like, is it, is it like that? Is there that, that newbie, like, oh, oh, them. I don't think so. I mean, I'm not really big into the community itself. I mean, yeah. I, I surf, uh, you know, the van dwellers subreddit on occasion just to kind of you know, I learned a lot through there and I've made some posts to hopefully help spread some of the knowledge I learned. You know, I try to contribute back as mm -hmm. much as I can. Yeah. Um, um, especially, especially like when I built the first one, I mean, that was kind of the early days of the, the trendy part of van life. Um, and so I tried to contribute back like, well, how do you build out a sprinter? I mean, well, how do you like do you know, contour walls and like what parts fit and that sort of stuff. And, you know, I would like to document better document and, and post van two and my van and my third van filled. Yeah. Their third van build. Um, but there's a lot of resources out there now. I mean, people have been doing it for a long time now. And, you know, as much as I would like to, I'm just got other priorities right now. And maybe someday I'll get around to like blogging or, or posting it onto a website or something just to kind of contribute back what I've learned. Um, but no, it's, there's certainly the snobby side to it. I mean, there's certainly the people who are willing to drop $120,000 on a van and think that anything less is 
just junk but oh, please. for the most part it's a, it's a really cool community i mean yeah on van dwellers i mean there's there's people with hundred thousand dollar vans there's people with you know rusted out astro vans and like people are super supportive you know it's I, you know the key part is just about you know following a lifestyle that you think will fit you and making do with it and yeah. whether it's out of necessity because you don't have anything or out of you know a realization that you don't want anything um and so it's it's a really cool community that yeah. i think generally is supportive i mean you see people on there who are super supportive of like the junk fans but you look at their history and they clearly have a hundred thousand dollar van and it's hmm. it's a pretty cool community that seems to work together really well oh, that's neat yeah that's that's super cool oh we did have another uh, uh comment from the chat uh apparently all g4 style bulbs are 12 volts g4 I think I assume that's well. I assume that's kind of like one of the socket bulbs you fit, you know, like into fittings in RVs and stuff. Um, kind of the, the the bulbs I was talking about was like, you know, they're sold as like under cabinet, like kitchen lights, you know, mm-hmm. little like thin silver puck lights. Um, yeah. Oh, I whoops! I don't know if you posted one of the photos I sent you this morning. I don't know if that got if that made it up. One it of the was kind of the, towards the was, end. There's a there's a good chance I'll be able to get to it without going through too many things. <laughs> we'll find out. Let's let's see. Um, Puck lights in the no, where, five and G eight or it was where my progress ended last night. Was uh, is it the okay. one? Cool. Well, good. is it the one that shows the ceiling? Like, uh, how do I put this? Yeah, it shows all the lights facing down over the cabinetry. Oh, um, okay. Uh... You know, I sure thought I put that in there, but it sure doesn't look like I did. Hold on. We'll get that. We'll get it in there. Oh. Just keep... That was kind of what the progress I made it to last night. It was like, there are these little silver, you know, I mean, they're only like three eighths inch or half inch or something puck lights and just surface mount puck lights. Um, they're sold as like under cabinet lights for kitchens, you know, like spice up your like kitchen cabinetry or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, if you cut the transformer off, the light itself is 12 volt. So, so you did but go to sold, Ikea. These aren't Ikea. These I'm are Amazon, but they're basically the same. <laughs> I'm totally kidding, yeah. Uh, I definitely see. looked at Ikea, though. You definitely what? Looked at the ones at Ikea, though. Well, I mean, how can you not, really? Uh, I mean, my... So the only thing from Ikea in my van is my countertop and the faucet. Oh, right. I have the picture. Boom. Nice. Nailed it. It's coming? Yeah, well, maybe yeah. a minute, minute or so it'll come up. Yeah, that's the wrong one. But that does show your awesome panel. We never got to the panel. Ah, your panel's awesome. All right. Let's see. It's probably under this. Nope, that's us. Almost there. High production value right here, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, there we go. So that's that's looking at the like kitchen countertop with the lights and everything on. Is that the one that you were after, or you want the other one? Well, yeah, I mean just that one. It's it's not on the stream yet, so I don't know what what photo you've got up right now. Oh, I've got the one that's, um, that's uh, showing off the. Uh, oh, it's before the sink is done. Here, let me let me show the sink. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so right now I see the uh, the one with the lights overhead, and then the panel in the background, and then the countertop without anything in it. There we go. Now I got the good one. Um, yeah, so those are sold as like kitchen cabinet, on, you know, under lights, but I needed them to be twelve volt instead of one hundred and twenty. Um, and luckily, the actual LED module itself was twelve volt. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, if you want to, I mean, we can talk about the panel real quick before we finish up, if you'd like. Uh, well, I don't, the, I never saw the pictures that come through, so I don't know what's going on. I, I wonder if Streamlabs has an upper limit on how many pictures I can display, because, uh, they were definitely in there, and they definitely weren't in there. So, I'm not sure what happened to them. You know what, I, I will go ahead and pull it up, because they, they are awesome, and they should be recognized. One second. Here we go. Photos. Processed. Yeah, you say you're in there, but you weren't in there. 
Uh, let's see. I will show. Let's see. I'll show the laser printing part first here. Eventually. Go Windows Photo. All right. So did you design this from, from scratch? Yeah. I mean, I took inspiration from Blue Sea Systems. They are a distributor of marine components. Mm -hmm. um, they're about 10x the price of anything else you would pay. <laughs> um, but, you know, for a panel like that with the AC switches built in, I think it's about $300. Um, and so... I decided I didn't really care to to venture down that route. So I thought, well, I figure out a way to laser cut something out of acrylic and do the engravings so I can, you know, embed the paint in the in the recess portions and see if I can make it work. I mean, my my ultimate goal was to eventually buy some of that um that double layer acrylic where it'll be like white acrylic with a black layer on top. So you can engrave the top. So you have like a black panel with white lettering. Mm -hmm. Um I just never, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, I didn't even want to try ordering something or whatever so oh what uh, this is is just just super standard fast. acrylic super fast here uh, to servo uh he's heading over to lost i'm pretty sure we're gonna be heading over there as well after we get done so uh let him know yeah. people people are coming so you were uh, sorry go back to uh what, you, what what were you saying about the panel oh so you know i just i didn't really know much about it i mean i've done very minimal laser cutting or anything um mm -hmm. so i just played around with, you know, probably a half a dozen different prototypes and like engraved powers and everything. And, and you know, trying to paint it and just figuring out how I could get white letters with a black background. And um, so basically I just did a, did an engrave, right. You know, got a piece of acrylic taped over it. Um, got my, got my engraved powers, right. Mm -hmm. um, so then I engraved it, cut it. What did I do? Then I took it and, you know, got like, Oh, there was, uh, oh, the over on the electronics station, there's kind of the magnifier, the glass thing, the loop thing. Yeah. And basically, took that with some tools, cleaned up the lettering, make sure the letters are nice and crisp, mm -hmm. shot it with white spray paint um, for the lettering, let that dry overnight, and then came back again with tools, like really carefully pulled all the tape off so it didn't like screw up any of the lettering, mm -hmm. and then turned it over and shot the black, the back side black. Um, the backside and all the edges. And since oh. you shoot all the edges, it basically makes a shadow box that you really can't tell that it's only painted on the backside because there's no way for like light to get behind the lettering. So it sure. looks like black acrylic, but it's only spray painted on the backside. I thought you were going to tell me it was black acrylic. Now I know. Nope, it is clear acrylic. It's, it's a hack. Huh. Well, that's pretty cool. You know, and only like two days later, Akeen came in and told me a really simple way to get white lettering in acrylic, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right right on time after you need it. Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome, man. Well, thanks again. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Uh, I, I super, super do appreciate it because this, this has been really cool. You can tell because we're about a half hour over time, but you know what? I'm good with that. That's awesome. No worries. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I got a notification that uh, we've uh, completed all the steps to become affiliate. So, dun, 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 dun. Uh, yay. Yay. We can now make that sweet, sweet podcast loot. <laughs> we, we will be tens and heirs. Yeah, just don't forget it was me. <laughs> it me was. Got there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> You you were there at the very beginning. You were you were there when we were just mere podcasters, and soon we will be mere podcasters with nothing extra because we'll be giving it to the shop. But <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> It'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, we'll we'll get ready to live that champagne lifestyle. Oh, uh, also catch us next uh, Monday. This coming Monday, I've got one one or one or two pro, uh, 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 projects that I'll be working on. It's either going to be, do I have the parts to start this drum machine? Or uh, it will be making a, a circuit board uh, to run some MIDI stuff over here. So that's gonna be our on our project stream. That's every Monday at 7.30, right here on Twitch TV forward slash Sin Shop. And, uh, and of course you can catch us every single Friday next Friday Maybe next, maybe Monday, but definitely Friday, we will have hopefully a victory party because 
because a, a certain thing will have expired by then and it's going to either be awesome or there will be sadness throughout the land i really think it's going to be awesome but we'll see but check us out uh next friday for sure uh and uh and if you can make it on monday as well for the project stream is going to be awesome but anyway, uh, yes, for more information about the shop, go to sinshop.org. Uh, for more information uh, about upcoming events that we have, go to sinshop.org. Uh, sorry, go to meetup.com forward slash sinshop uh, to find out when we're opening uh, through all the COVID whatnot. Uh, go to sinshop.org forward slash COVID status, C-O-V-I-D-S-T-A-T-U-S. Sean, thank you again so much for joining us tonight. It's been, it's been a giggle. Uh, and, uh, and until next week, I am, of course, the Mighty Pong. I'm Sean. And uh, that's our show for this week. Have yourself a great yeah. weekend. And uh, I think well, we're coming over to Lost's channel, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, raid Lost's channel and say hi. Outstanding. We will definitely do that. So you stay right there. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll the uh, shows over thing just like this. <laughs>